Thank you. Thank you. So today to give the keynote address at this luncheon, we have a very special guest. Uh, in 2014, Cornell William Brooks became the 18th person to serve as the chief executive of the NAACP. Uh, prior to joining the NAACP, he led the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice as president and CEO, where he successfully led the passage of laws combating foreclosures during the housing crisis and developed workforce development and training programs. He was previously the senior counsel with the FCC, working on legal policy matters, uh, promoting small business and media ownership diversity. At a U.S. Department of Justice, or as a U.S. Department of Justice trial attorney, he secured the then largest government settlement for victims of housing discrimination based on testing. All right, here you go. His, his civil rights experience includes serving as executive, executive director of the Fair Housing Council of Greater Washington and as a trial attorney with the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. NCRC and NAACP are allies, we're friends, and partners in the work of creating social and economic justice. So we're pleased to have President Brooks and several others from the NAACP as speakers and attendees at this conference. So please give a warm welcome to President Cornell William Brooks of the NAACP. Good afternoon. I heard a rumor that this is the 25th anniversary year of NCRC. So if this is a good afternoon, I need to hear a 25th anniversary good afternoon. Good afternoon. John, now I know I'm in the right place. I started out as a baby lawyer uh, in this town 20 plus years ago, right out of Yale Law School. And one of the things that struck me was that there were a few organizations dedicated to Americans realizing the dream of home ownership. A few organizations filled with advocates, filled with freedom fighters, filled with soldiers of social justice. I am in the midst of an organization that has for 25 years worked toward fair housing, fair lending, affordable housing, and helping people realize their dream of home ownership, strong and just communities, and in so doing, realizing the American dream. So if for no other reason, give yourselves a loud, resounding, strong round of applause for where you are, what you've done, what you've accomplished, and what you represent to the country. I want to recognize uh, the work of John Taylor, recognize the work of the board of directors, our board chair, and to all of you who are here today. There's a part of a program formerly called Acknowledgements, but more properly understood as an occasion for an expression of appreciation. Because I understand that I'm not here as a consequence of a formulaic or formalistic invitation. I'm here as a consequence of your generosity on the backs of your work as a consequence of your dedication and your sacrifice. So I want you to express appreciation for all of the people who bring us here. That would be the people you serve. That would be your clients. That would be your communities. Can you put your hands together for them? Now, my brothers and sisters in the social justice struggle, I'm not here as the CEO of the NAACP by myself. I come representing a board of directors led by our board chair, Rosalind McAllister Brock, an NAACP foundation, and members, the rank and file, who are represented in 2,100 units in 50 states, five military installations abroad, 
high schools, colleges, Native American reservations, every large city in the country, thousands of small towns, prisons, and who represent the conscience of this country. That would be the world's greatest band of freedom fighters, otherwise known as the NAACP. Now, I know uh, that uh, we have a healthy contingent representing the NAACP here, uh, one of whom, uh, Sister Ali Parham, if you could raise your hand, from Alabama. There you go. And I want to recognize uh, from the Georgia State Conference, James Major Woodall. And from the Maryland State Conference, Mr. Ed, Edsel Brown. And New Jersey, Mr. Bruce Davis. From the West Coast, Ms. Shelley Seacrest. And if you just be, uh, bear with me, I just certainly want to recognize our uh, host, uh, President, uh, Mr. Kosua Ali from the D.C. branch, and uh, my, my homegirl from the hometown of the uh, national headquarters, Ms. Tessa Hill Aston. <laughs> you saw her leadership on display only a few months ago uh, during the Freddie Gray uh, crisis, which uh, yet uh, continues. I certainly want to recognize uh, members of Congress and members of our national uh, staff, uh, represented in our Washington Bureau uh, by Mr. Hillary Shelton. Uh, Ch Charles Lowry, if you could raise your hand. And uh, uh, Jonathan, uh, I think uh, Kevin Turner, uh, Peter Williams, all with the national staff. Lastly, uh, there's a person who has just received a promotion, John. Uh, I think somebody known to me, somebody known to you, uh, Miss Stella Adams. Yeah. Now, Stella, where are you? Stella, there we go. Wait. Thank you. I am told. I am told that uh, you are now the Chief of Civil Rights as of last month. I'm glad to meet someone who is more new in the job than I am. <laughs> Can we put our hands together for Ms. Adams? I'd like to just for a moment because I'm in the midst of such a distinguished crowd, an august crowd, uh, share with you a little story. Uh, I've spent many years as a minister, as many years as a trial lawyer, and I've not always been so fortunate to be in the midst of such a distinguished and august group of people. In fact, I can think of a time, true story, many years ago when I found myself in London, England on a Sunday morning as a young minister. I found myself standing outside of this beautiful Gothic cathedral with spires soaring toward the heavens, stained glass windows reflecting the iridescent, multi-hued, multicolored beauty of God. And as a young, innocent, presumptuous, naive preacher, I assumed that inside of this beautiful Gothic cathedral, there were about 2,000 or so people waiting to hear this young, naive, presumptuous preacher preach. But as I made my way into the sanctuary, I immediately noticed the obvious, Charles. The pastor and exactly two members. <laughs> One member I'll call Mrs. Jones. The other member I'll call Mrs. Smith. Now, I have to ask you all, please do not share this story beyond the confines of this room. But I did as I was taught to do, which is to say that you preach, you speak, you share to two people in the same way that you would preach, you share, or speak to 2,000, with sincerity, with conviction, with a sense of one's purpose. 
So I made my way to the pulpit and I began to preach and I immediately noticed the obvious. Then Miss Jones immediately fell asleep. <laughs> True story. But as I was speaking, I noticed that Miss Smith seemed to hang on to every word I had to say. She tapped her feet, she clapped her hands, she nodded her head, she said amen at all the right the theological moments, she said hallelujah at all the right liturgical times, and I thought to myself, at least I'm reaching one somebody this Sunday morning. So I concluded my little homily, made my way out of the pulpit, made my way to the side of the pastor, and the pastor said to me, Brother Brooks, I'm just so sorry. Miss Jones, she falls asleep on everybody. <laughs> and Miss Smith, is out of her mind and did not understand a thing you had to say. <laughs> so you can see why I am so delighted <laughs> to be in the midst of this august, distinguished audience, so wide awake and presumably in your right minds. We are at a moment in American history that is trying morally, troubling civically. It is a moment poised between seemingly chaos and calamity. It is a moment in which we find ourselves aligned along fault lines of race and ethnicity, lined up on fissures of class and caste. We find ourselves amidst a season of social justice. We're all across the length and breadth of this republic in hamlets and villages, cities and towns. We find Americans of every hue and every heritage, of every region and every race, now asserting with one voice amidst this season of social justice, now is the winter of our discontent. Citizens, mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles, grandmothers and grandfathers, who find themselves in the throes of a rising tide of income inequality that yet threatens to overwhelm them, to drown them, to drown and suppress their aspirations and their ambitions as citizens of this republic, as workers in this economy. We find ourselves at a difficult moment. It is a moment in which our fellow citizens, not knowing where to turn, under whose leadership under whose leadership to turn are tempted again and again to turn on one another. As a driver of this predicament is this challenge of income inequality. This is not a uniquely American challenge. It's not a peculiarly American challenge. We know it all around the world, in countries large and small, a rising tide of income inequality. But we note in this country, the crossroads of aspiration and opportunity. In our nation, the most affluent, most powerful, most emblematic of human aspiration and human ideals, in our America, profound gaps between the haves and the have-nots. For the first time in recent American history, we have a generation of parents who cannot say with confidence, cannot assert with certitude that their children will do better than they have done. We're at a moment when grandparents looking at parents struggling at the end of every week and at the end of every month trying to put pennies together in order to make dollars of existence. We find those grandparents 
frustrated because the dreams that they had for themselves, their children have not realized, and their children's children are not yet realizing, notwithstanding the low unemployment rate. It's a moment in which soldiers of social justice, advocates of a better American way, find themselves frustrated because those who have high moral aspirations, high professional ambitions, come to us with their dreams, their hopes, their longing for a better tomorrow, today. They're frustrated. This rising tide of income inequality touches every corner of the republic. But in certain places, it hits with a certain brutal efficiency when it is aided and abetted by the weight and force of race. There was a scholar and prophet and sociologist of the last century by the name of William Edward Burgat Du Bois, who was the first employee of a fledgling civil rights organization called the NAACP. W.E.B. Du Bois spoke with a prophetic gaze, a prophetic understanding of the future a Van Dyke beard and a certain regal bearing. He spoke about the problem of the 20th century being that of the color line. He talked about an America shrouded beneath a veil of race and ethnicity. And another member of the NAACP, not a sociologist, not a prophet, but a world-class physicist by the name of Albert Einstein, this rank and file member of the NAACP described race as America's worst disease. We understand that income inequality at this present moment is not detached, not unrelated, not unconnected to America's original sin. Consider the scholar Nathan Nunn, who points out that when we look at the areas of this country that are yet struggling with income inequality the least successfully, those are the very corners of the republic that have a long history of race being the prominent social justice challenge. This scholar points out that when we look at the communities, the counties, that led the nation in slave ownership coming, in, coming out of Reconstruction. Those are the very communities, the very counties, the very corners of our republic that yet wrestle with how to best serve their citizens. Those are the very communities, the very counties that resist the compelling call to invest in infrastructure to invest in education, to invest in public services. Those are the very communities that are often sold a toxic brew, a formula of political misdirection, guns, Bible, class, caste, anything but those solutions that actually lift people out of poverty and put them on a road to affluence and a road to the middle class. Those would be the very communities we serve, the small towns and the big cities where people come to the ballot box, they enter the voting booth, and in their ears we hear the voice of distraction, the voice of misdirection. Vote against your interests, vote against your communities, vote against your families, vote against your homes, vote against the very interests and the very aspirations that define us as a nation. Why? Because if we can look down on those who are black and brown, it must mean that we are standing where we should be, not noticing that you're standing at the very bottom of the economic ladder. These are the communities in which our fellow citizens 
vote against housing policies that put people in homes. They vote against community development policies that ensure strong, just, and morally grounded communities. These are also the communities that support criminal justice policies that set us back as a nation and that drive income inequality. Someone here is yet asking the question, well, what does criminal justice have to do with economic development? What does it have to do with housing? Well, may I remind you that when you have 2.2 million Americans behind bars, when black prisoners outnumber whites by a ratio of 5.4 to 1, and for Hispanics, 1.4 to 1 in terms of white American citizens, we have a challenge. When the drag on the nation's economy is $39 billion a year in terms of prison and correction costs, when we think about the fact that we lose 1.5 to 1.7 million jobs as a consequence of a person having a criminal record, when you have 65 million Americans with a criminal record, 100 million Americans who've been touched by the criminal justice system, this is not merely an overprescribed criminal justice challenge, it is an underdiagnosed, undiagnosed economic development problem. But we as a room of housing advocates understand that housing is a prime driver for income inequality in this country. So when we have discussions on the campaign trail about addressing income inequality, bringing back the middle class, I dare say, and I mean no partisan parroting here, but making America great again. <laughs> when we make such an assertion and we talk about jobs, infrastructure investment, workforce development, but we don't talk about the biggest asset most Americans have, we miss the boat, we miss the conversation, we miss the need, we miss the moment. When the wealth of white households is 13 times the median wealth of black households in 2013 compared to eight times the wealth in 2010, when the wealth of white households is now 10 times the wealth of Hispanic households compared to nine times the wealth in 2010, when the gap between African Americans and white Americans has reached its highest point an alpine height of economic desperation since 1989, when white Americans have seven time, 17 times the wealth of African American households, we face a profound challenge. This leads to a country where the real median household income for white families tops $60,000 a year, but is only $42,000 a year for Hispanic households, and for black households, 35 thousand dollars a year. This leads to a country of 321 million people, yet 14 percent, more than 47 million of our brothers and sisters yet living before, below the official poverty line. That would be living in a dank sub-basement of the American economy where people are eking out existence and having to look into the eyes of their children knowing that they don't have what they need to ensure that their children have what they need and what they want. We are a nation where a prime driver for this is housing. Consider when African Americans make up 13% of the population, but only receive 5.2% of home purchase loans made in 2014. And the value of these loans is just 83% compared to the national average. When Hispanic, Hispanic borrowers close on the home loans, roughly 60% of the time, and African American homeowners only do so 52% of the time, and where white Americans are able to do so 68% uh, of the time, that's a substantial gap. 
Said another way, when the denial rate for African Americans is 16%, for Hispanic Americans, 13%, but for whites, 8%, we have a challenge. In fact, scholars tell us that if you want to do more, do the most for raising incomes, raising wealth, this eradicating the wealth gap, the income inequality gap between African Americans, white Americans, and Latinos. Invest in homes. Invest in a sound housing policy. Well, you can't talk about jobs without talking about housing. You can't talk about work without also talking about communities. You can't talk about where people go to work without talking about where they live. These two things are inextricably bound, and unless we understand and unless we invest in a housing economy, we can't talk about a jobs economy. But the challenge for us is how do we make the case? Traditionally, we've made the argument that African Americans, Latinos, people of color, as the scholar, scholar Lonnie Guineer has pointed out, are like canaries in the coal mine. When the whole of the economy catches a coal, we get pneumonia. The canaries perish in a coal mine before the coal miners. And yet we make the argument that the best way to save the canary is by saving all the coal miners. Notwithstanding the fact that the canaries have a shorter life expectancy. We've often made the case that we have to engage in programs that provide a universal benefit, that are broadly based, that are a matter of universal eligibility. The scholar William Julius Wilson talks about the fact that if you want to advance the well-being of African Americans, Latinos, people of color, we need to talk about broad-based solutions, Social Security, VA benefits. That is a compelling argument. But our challenge becomes when we make the case for broad-based solutions while ignoring the particularity of the problem. So in other words, when we ignore the fact that we have, in robust fashion, discrimination in the housing market. I can tell you as a fair housing, former fair housing litigator, when you sue an apartment complex that keeps a list of applicants with notations like these, black, definitely exclude, curly haired Jew, in quotes, definitely exclude, exclude. Dark skin, South American, don't let in. When you have housing providers that are explicit in their efforts to keep out people of color, we don't need broad-based solutions. We need targeted, focused law enforcement. We cannot ignore the brutal reality of race. We can't ignore the fact that, the, that this mortgage crisis, the credit crisis, the foreclosure crisis did not strike the country universally, blandly, and equally. It struck black and brown communities with a force, with a power that we are yet recovering from today. This is not a moment for us to blink the reality of race. This is not a moment for us to duck the challenge of the hour, which is to look at our black and brown neighbors, but also our white American neighbors, our Catholic, Gentile, Jew and Gentile, our Episcopalian, our Baptist, our rural, our urban, nader, urban neighbors, and address the challenge before the country, which is to say we have to take on and build the case to fight income inequality. One of the ways for us to do that is by linking the importance of the vote with the importance of investing in sound housing policy. Can I say that again? It's not enough for us to talk about advocacy on the Hill. It's not enough for us to talk about advocacy in state capitals. It's not enough for us to talk about the latest and greatest and the best exotic or boutique loan program coming out of a bank. Not enough for us to talk about more dollars 
for counseling for loans that the people will never get because banks have decided to not be in that business. We support, I support as an advocate, successfully so, putting more dollars into counseling. But our challenge becomes when people support our counseling, their potential customers, then they decline to serve those customers and those communities. This is a do loop of frustration. This is a do loop of challenge. We have to get out of that and make sure that the banks are doing what it is that they say they want to do. There are a couple things that might be done that we stand together on. That is, principal reductions and loan modifications through Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. Second, strengthening and enforcing the Fair Housing Act. Third, encourage shared equity loans between private investors and struggling or first-time homeowners. We've got to think about new ways to address long-standing old problems. Fourth, using alternative credit models rather than relying on the exclusive use of FICO scores. In the wake of a devastating foreclosure crisis, credit crisis that has represented a generational dispossession of the African American community. Why do we need to pin our community salvation on the mechanical, blindly arithmetic application of a FICO score? Can't we develop a better yardstick, a better measuring rod? for people's aspirations, for their ambitions, for their willingness and their commitment to be responsible homeowners. That we can do. <laughs> Adopt a 21st Century Homestead Act. A 21st Century Homestead Act would give home, home, home purchasers liberal access to government-backed preferred rate 30-year fixed mortgages the right to a first position on purchasing foreclosed homes for those who have lost their homes due to proven mortgage fraud, purchasers who participate in HUD-approved counseling programs, and those who've served in the military, and capital improvement grants to purchasers of foreclosed homes. Here's the point. We need to, new tools. We cannot take on old challenges with old tools. First-time home buyer tax credits. But my brothers and sisters, it's not enough for us to have the right policy prescriptions. It's not enough for us to simply know the right thing to do. We have to mobilize the vote. I want to talk with you or close with two images. One, a house, and two, a temple. A house and a temple. A prophet by the name of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. spoke about a world house a house in which people were divided, living in separate rooms, separated by race, separated by class, separated by region, separated by religion, separated by race. Were we to understand this metaphor in contemporary terms, we'd understand that we, as a country, are living in America's house, separated by race, separated by religion, separated by region, living in different rooms, Making the metaphor and the reality more difficult, we're trying to talk to one another through the walls. We're trying to communicate to one another through the walls. We're being rendered unintelligible, unable to hear one another, unable to see one another, unable to connect with one another as a consequence of divisions that separate us, that operate as walls in this American house. Now let me tell you, let's move from the house to a temple. We understand that this country is not merely a house. It is a temple of democracy. And we understand that in this temple of democracy, there is something called the vote. 
The vote is a civic sacrament. We understand that in 1965, a brave band of Americans watched a president by the name of Lyndon Baines Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act into law with a series of ceremonial presidential pens. But we understand in this room that that law may have been signed into law with presidential pens, but it was enacted as a statue with the blood, sweat, and tears of those who sacrificed themselves on the Edmund Pettus Bridge for the right to vote. We're not merely standing in a house. We're standing in a temple of democracy. And we can yet look through those windows and we yet understand that the right to vote shines in the constellation of our freedoms, in the night sky of our rights. As a North Star, we yet say we will not allow that light to go out. We will not allow that light to dim. We will not allow that light to darken. We will live and die for the right to vote. Standing in this temple of democracy, there are those who are not yet believers in the magisterial beauty of our Constitution. There are those who are not yet believers in the infinite possibilities of Americans. There are those who are not yet believers in our ability to embrace one another as neighbors and as citizens. There are those who are standing on the perimeters of your work and this room who do not yet believe that you can turn around this economy, you can turn around this republic, you can turn around broken communities. There are those who yet do not yet believe that you can bridge the chasm of race, you can bridge the chasm of region, you can bridge the chasm of religion, you can yet bridge the chasms that divide us and separate us and keep us in separate rooms. There are those who do not yet believe that we are standing in this temple of democracy and we will, we will take our ballots, we will take our right to vote, and we will bring about sound, just, moral housing policies that make a difference in the lives of our fellow citizens. That's who we are, that's what we do, that's what we're committed to. We will not give up, we will not give in, we will not give over because we are advocates, we are justice soldiers. So standing in this temple of democracy, we look at those who yet live in different communities. Other side of the track, around the corner, around the block, we say, you have a shared stake in this economy. You have a shared stake in the American dream. You need not be angry. You need not be frustrated. You need not be distrustful. You need not wonder what this country will become. We know what this country can become because all we need to do is look into our hearts, look into who we are, what we represent, the values that we bring forward. Standing in this temple of democracy, we understand that this is a powerful moment in American history, a third reconstruction, if you will. This is a moment where we have the opportunity to use the franchise to make the case that we can bring the whole of the country together. We don't have to watch campaign rallies that, dis that descend into wrestling matches. We don't have to watch a presidential campaign that resembles not a demonstration of democracy, but reality TV. We don't have to watch candidates thinking that they are, thinking that they are debating one another and yet debasing our democracy. We can take our vote, we can take our ballot, we can take our activism, and we can yet turn this nation around. So I'm calling upon all of you 
This is a very specific ask here. I'm coming, calling upon all of you to come to Washington or come back to Washington to join something we call Democracy Awakening, where we're calling on the nation to come to Washington, D.C., April 16th, 17th, and 18th, and to participate in a campaign to protect the right to vote, to ensure the integrity of the vote, and get out the vote. That is to say, in the wake of Shelby versus Holder, where we have a weakened Voting Rights Act, where we've seen a Machiavellian frenzy of voter disenfranchisement from one end of the country to the other, we are yet saying we're going to stand up for the right to vote. We're yet saying we are going to get dirty money out of politics to ensure the integrity of the vote. And lastly, we're saying we're going to stand with an intergenerational, multiracial, multi-ethnic, multiracial band of younger people and older people, and we're going to march by the millions to the ballot box. November is going to be a wake-up call on this democracy, but we need everyone here. And yes, in mid-April, some of us are going to be arrested. Some of us are going to engage in civil disobedience. Some of us are going to honor the civic tradition of Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks and a man by the name of Mohandas K. Gandhi. Some of us are going to stand up for the right to vote, the integrity of the vote, and getting out the vote in Congress with Democracy Awakening. Now, before I take my seat, can I tell you why I believe in you and believe in what we can do? This summer, the NAACP called for what was entitled formally is America's Journey for Justice. We marched from the home of the Voting Rights Act in Selma, Alabama, to the seat of our democracy here in Washington, D.C., a journey of 1,002 miles by foot. We marched, and I had the privilege and honor of marching beside a man whose formal name was Middle Passage. We marched from Selma, Alabama, from the foot of the Edmund Pettus Bridge, 900 miles to Spotsylvania County in the suburbs of D.C. Middle Passage, a Navy veteran, a veteran of the Vietnam War, who survived five heart surgeries. He came having marched 900 miles, carrying the American flag nearly every step of the way. In a rainstorm, he wrapped up the flag. When the sun came out, he unfurled the flag. When he unfurled the flag, we came to a stop, and he literally collapsed to the ground, and he died. Hardest day at the NAACP as CEO. Explaining to a group of young people back at our church that Middle Passage did not survive once he got to the hospital. But the second, or rather the hardest question I've ever been asked, young people said to me, if a man died for the right to vote, why can't we vote and fight for the right to vote? This election, it's about us standing up for our principles, us standing up for our integrity, us standing up for our values, us standing up for the work that you have long done over 25 years, us standing up for this country. And if by chance you grow weary, if by chance you grow discouraged, let me remind you of a little hymn of the NAACP, the words being these, lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun. Let us march on, let us march on, let us march on, let us march on, march on till victory is won.